Under the hood, a computer sees everything as binary numbers. It has different places it can write down binary numbers to remember them, and special hardware to manipulate those binary numbers in simple, repeatable ways. The earliest programming languages required us to manually keep track of where every piece of useful data was in the computer and what it represented. Modern programming languages give us the first level of abstraction above that by letting us give pieces of data semantically meaningful names and shorthand syntax for the basic operations. We call those meaningful pieces of data variables, and we're going to dive right in and look at how to use variables in C++. So here we have a variable declaration in C++ syntax. We're going to talk about three distinct parts of this variable declaration, the type, the identifier, and the initializer. We're going to start by looking at the type. One of the things we want to emphasize throughout this training is how to use the documentation to answer your own questions. The documentation source we'll be using for the C++ language and standard library is cppreference.com. So let's go see what it has to say about types. And here we can see that it says that type is a property which both restricts the operations that are permitted on an entity and provides semantic meaning to an otherwise generic sequence of bits. So what does this definition actually mean? Well, it tells us that the type information we give to the computer is going to restrict what we are actually allowed to do with one of our variables. And it helps the computer understand what our variables actually mean. This lets the computer figure out how to interpret various pieces of binary data that it might see under the hood and know whether those should be interpreted as some integer or some floating point number. Without the type information, the computer wouldn't know which of these answers was correct because it only had a string of binary digits and no other extra information. There are several fundamental types, and these are types that are built into the language to form the backbone of the type system. The list of fundamental types includes int, and we use this for integral or whole numbers, double or float for rational or floating point numbers of different sizes, bool for boolean or true-false values, and char to store single characters in their ASCII numeric form. And there are many more fundamental types, some of which we'll see later in the semester. These fundamental types are often composed together into higher level abstract types to represent things more complex than a single number. The next part in our variable declaration is the identifier. Identifiers are just a human readable name for an entity, in this case a variable. While the type can tell us that our variable holds an integral number, the identifier explains what particular number this variable holds. So in our example variable declaration, the int here tells us that we're using a whole number, but our identifier m and m count lets us know that this variable holds the count of m and m's in our system. Looking back at our documentation, we can see that all identifiers in C++ must follow certain rules and avoid some patterns that are reserved by the standard. For example, identifiers are not allowed to be keywords that are already used for other purposes. Our identifiers can't have a double underscore anywhere within them. Our identifiers can't begin with an underscore followed by an uppercase letter, and our identifiers cannot begin with an underscore at all if they're in the global namespace, which we'll talk about later. Now these rules might seem a little bit weird and arbitrary, but you don't run into them that often. The standard has reserved intentionally ugly identifier patterns so that our code can stay nice and clean. And now the final part of our variable declaration is the initializer, and that's this section over here. This part gives our variable a value to start with. It is possible to declare a variable without the initializer, but this can lead to some nasty bugs, so it's best practice to always include an initializer for our variables. Initialization in C++ has a long history with many changes. There are a variety of different ways to initialize variables in C++, but they all work towards the same goal, which is to give our variable a starting value. We'll cover initialization in more depth later, and for now, we'll just stick to this syntax. Now that we can agree with the computer on names for different pieces of data and what type rules apply to them, we need a way to ask the computer to actually do something with those variables. Operators serve just that purpose. There is a long list of operators available in C++, and we'll touch on many of them throughout training. For this video, let's just focus on the most common, 
The basic arithmetic operators do exactly what they would do on your calculator. The basic comparison operators let us compare two variables. Double equals and exclamation point equals let us ask if two variables are equivalent or not equivalent. Less than, greater than, less than or equal to, and greater than or equal to let us ask how two variables would compare in a sort. The logical operators let us manipulate logical expressions. A single exclamation point negates a logical expression, turning true to false and false to true. Two ampersand characters join two logical expressions with an and, and two pipe characters join two logical expressions with an or. Wherever you see two plus signs or two minus signs, you're either incrementing, adding one to the variable, or decrementing, subtracting one from the variable. And finally, note that the arithmetic operators can be combined with the assignment operator to use the destination variable as one of the inputs to that. So a plus equals b will take the sum of the values in a and b and then store that result in the variable a. Now let's say a few more words about types because the type system is very important in C++. It lets us reuse code such that the computer does the right thing depending on the types involved. And without it, computers would not be able to make many of the assumptions that they use to optimize our code. C++ uses static type checking. That means that the computer is gonna look through our code before it runs, assign a type to every piece of data, and that type can't change while we're running the code. So once we declare MNM count to be an int, it will always be an int in our code. If we try to do something with that variable that ints aren't allowed to do, our code will fail to run. C++ code is not allowed to change the types of variables ad hoc in ways other languages might permit. In practice, this helps us ensure that our code is doing what we think it should be doing, and when used well, this makes our code safer. There are ways, however, to write code when you don't know what type of data you're working with. This is critical for code reuse and widely applicable libraries. We'll see several examples of these later in training, but it's important to remember that the computer will always assign a type to the data flowing through these sections of code, and no identifiers can change type while the program is running. Let's look at the first example of a place where the computer figures out a type for us, the auto keyword. In a variable declaration, auto tells the computer to deduce the type of the variable from the initializer. Auto is just a placeholder. Once the computer figures out the type it should be from the initializer, that variable is that type for the rest of the program. So in this example, our initializer is an integer constant, which means that the compiler is going to figure out that my variable should be an int. So it's going to replace the auto placeholder with int, and now my variable will always be an int for the rest of our program. The auto keyword can be used in many places throughout C++. Just know that it is always a placeholder for the computer to figure out a type for us. It can be very handy in places where complex types become very long. Variables, operators, and the type system are some of the most fundamental parts of C++. With these under our belt, we can start making programs that do useful things and start looking at ways to build larger and more interesting programs.